how to deal with criticism. Uh, 10 ways how I deal with criticism or 10 truths that you need to learn about dealing with criticism. Now, um, this video is not coming from a place of I got heavily criticized this week or last week. Absolutely not. Um, some people ask me a question um, behind the scenes. Some people who even came to our city and who have interviewed uh, me for some other thing that they were doing and a lot of times they would come to me and they say, well, you know, you have this influence. You have a lot of criticism most likely. How do you deal with it? And so, as I started to reflect on what's happening in my own life and looked at other people's lives, um, there are a few things that I wanted to share with you. I heard this quote. I'll share with you two quotes before I share my 10 ways of dealing with criticism. I heard this quote that says, it's hard to take criticism from someone who hasn't constructed anything or it's hard to take constructive criticism from those who have not constructed anything and I agree with that. I think a lot of people try to provide constructive criticism but they themselves have never constructed anything. Uh, the other quote that I heard that if you are a leader or involved in anything in ministry and you come under attack, I want you to kind of uh, remember this one and this one is that demolition workers are disguised as construction workers. Come on, that's a good one right there. Demolition workers are many times disguised. So they, people who want to demolish you, they will be a lot of times actually um, disguised as people who want to construct something. And so we just have to be very careful to begin to take advice from a lot of those people. So let's begin. Number one, when it comes to dealing with criticism, you must not develop a persecution complex by treating every attack as a persecution. Now, this is huge. Before I go and I encourage us in our dealing with criticism, there's something we must understand. Not every criticism is undeserved. Some of us are full of ego, arrogance, laziness and bad habits. We are being punished, not persecuted. We have to be very careful that we don't pull scriptures out of context and comfort ourselves in our compromises when in reality we should be repenting. Ouch. Persecution in the Bible is when we suffer for the righteousness sake, 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 14. For godly living, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 12. For kingdom of God, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 5. And as a Christian, 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 16. And for Christ's sake, Philippians uh, 1 29. Many people get persecuted for stupid. They say stupid stuff. They get angry. They pick fights with other believers online. They name call people. They go and they provoke things, they happen, they do stuff that is just wrong and they get attacked. Some of us, we've made mistakes and sins in ministry that get us attacked. And then we say, oh, I'm under such a persecution. Well, not really. You screwed up. You made a mess. You're not under persecution. You're being disciplined and you're being publicly humiliated and humbled. <gasps> But God forgave me. People didn't. People don't trust you anymore. Why? Because you broke that trust by not living a life that's supposed to be a life of example. Now this, this person that I'm describing, it could be me if not for the grace of God. You have to understand there's a difference between Joseph going to jail because he ran from sexual sin and Samson going to jail because he ran with sexual sin. Both people were in jail but for different reasons. Joseph was falsely accused but Samson deserved all that he had coming because he was a womanizer. So to say that your persecution, we have to ask ourselves honestly, where is this coming from? Am I, have I been walking with God or have I been ignoring God, ignoring the Holy Spirit, been living fleshly life, been living a life that doesn't please the Holy Spirit and doesn't please the Lord, been walking in rebellion, made a mess out of my life and now I am being persecuted now in my jail and oh I'm just under such a persecution. Really? It could, might not be persecution, it might actually be punishment, pruning. It might be God disciplining you and letting you know, hey, uh, you can't be doing this stuff. And so it's very important that we don't treat every single thing as a persecution because there are things we've done in our own life that we need to repent from. 
and some public even criticism will come in and will pinpoint those things and we need to deal with that stuff. Again, not every critic is correct, but there are some criticisms that Christians come under, I see, and they quickly brush it off as, oh, I'm being persecuted, when in reality it's a persecution complex, when in reality they're not being persecuted. They're actually being disciplined or punished. Three people were on the cross. Jesus, He was there because He was in the will of God. Two other guys were there because they were committing sins. So it's wrong to say that two criminals on the cross were there persecuted. They were not persecuted. They were punished. Jonah was in the storm. Jonah was not in the storm because he was under attack. Jonah was in the storm because he was running from God. And so it's important that before we deal with how to overcome unhealthy criticism that we first examine our own heart and don't treat every criticism as undeserving because some criticism we well deserved it. And that criticism is supposed to lead us to our knees and to repent of our sin instead of blame everybody as a heretic, you know, Facebook police or these people who are just on our case. Because if we genuinely misrepresented Jesus, if we took the Scripture out of context historically and we did this stuff, we, we need to be, uh, we need to repent of that. We need to deal with that. And we're not being attacked, uh, we're being corrected. I had this happen to me uh, this week, some of you have seen it, where um, I posted a post and even though it wasn't me who posted, it was uh, one of our team members, but it was me who set this whole thing in motion of posts being posted. And previously I gave credit to this person who I read the book um, from, very impactful book. And then I drew some points and put it in my notes and it quickly became an Insta book. Uh, and there was exact statements from this book that I did not give a reference or a credit to a particular author who wrote this book. Now, some people will argue and I had people who come to my defense and say, Vlad, you didn't do anything wrong, everything belongs to Jesus and I feel you. That's my approach usually. Uh, my content is copyrighted, you have a right to copy. And so people re-preach my messages, I never get in their case, you know, whether they gave me credit or not. I give my stuff for free. Most of you know my attitude toward that. But again, um, in a world of um, writing, there is such a thing as plagiarism. There's such a thing as uh, you're taking somebody's content and you are using it and saying that you said those things, you wrote those things when in reality you didn't. And it's actually, it's actually a felony. You can, you can get fined for that. And so, and I, of course I came under a little bit of heat in the beginning and felt very embarrassed, felt very wrong. Now I could have easily stepped out and said, oh, you know, uh, we, we shouldn't be, you know, protecting our name and, you know, we should, all of our stuff that God has given to us belongs to God and, and all of that. But I, I knew that this attack that I came under or a little persecution uh, was well deserved and it required for me to repent instead of to defend myself and to change and to make a public apology because publicly I posted that. And, you know, not only you know, I got really good response from the people that came and attacked me, but also it was a good humbling experience. And honestly, I started going through all of my notes and say, okay, where maybe I have made a quote or a statement that I heard from somebody else, but I did not give credit to whom credit is due. And that was really important for my character development because integrity cannot develop, be developed if we're plagiarizing, if we're not punctual, or if we're constantly ripping other people's stuff and making it as our own. And so again, I came under that attack, well deserved it because I was wrong and I needed to repent from that instead of defend myself. Even though I had enough ammunition in my little gun to defend myself. But that's, I wouldn't change if I defend myself. So it's very important that we understand that. That's number one. The second thing that I want to highlight about persecution and that is critici criticism is part of persecution. So the second thing about how to deal with persecution, how to deal with criticism is we have to understand not only the first thing I mentioned is sometimes criticism is well deserved and we have to examine whether we caused it and there's a God calling us to repentance. Or second thing we need to keep in mind is sometimes criticism is a part of persecution. Now the word persecution in Hebrew comes from the word pursue and bear a grudge against. So this idea of persecution is the idea of somebody hunting you down to inflict pain. It's an ill intent to cause evil treatment. Let me say that again. Persecution is somebody hunting you down to inflict pain. 
it's an ill intent to cause evil treatment. Two Greek words for persecution actually means to oppress and to afflict. So to oppress and to afflict. So the Hebrew word means to pursue somebody to cause them pain. Two Greek words mean to oppress and to afflict. When you're under persecution from your family members, when you're under persecution from church members, when you're under persecution from the world, you must understand it will feel like an oppression. It will be an affliction of pain and there are people who will hunt you down to cause you pain. So Jesus tells us there is three forms of this kind of a oppression. is persecution, reviling and being spoken evil against. Matthew chapter 5 verse 11 says this, Beware, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. So three forms of oppression okay, that Christians will experience that Jesus promises. The first one is called persecution and this one, the persecution is physical attacks on you. So this is physical assault. Somebody physically beats you. Now most of us do not experience that. Who watching this broadcast right now, you don't have people that are attacking you physically and if you do and you are in the United States, call the police because the law is still on your side. There are countries in the world today where people are given green light to physically attack believers and we need to be praying for those believers who are going through this persecution. The second form of persecution or the second form of oppression is being reviled against. Reviling speaks of personal insults against us. Now personal insults, it's when people verbally insult you. And of course, that's being done today through media, that's being done today through comments, that's being done today when people, your family members maybe will verbally say stuff um, in your face. And so this is not physical. So maybe it doesn't hurt physically as much, but it does hurt emotionally and in our soul because it's still an assault, except it's an insult verbally. And the third level of persecution or the third level of oppression is false accusation. And this one, this one hurts deeply because it's not just somebody is evil and they're just saying all kinds of negative stuff about you, but it's somebody who is evil and they say all kinds of false things against you and they spread those things. And you're being painted in the image that is not true. And somebody who literally takes and burns your reputation to the ground. And a lot of times there's very little thing that you can do. You can hire attorneys, but in Joseph's case, attorneys wouldn't help him when Potiphar's wife destroyed his reputation. In Jesus' case, you know, they said all kinds of false things against him. It got him killed. Jesus was killed falsely. Now, we know he died as a Lamb of God on our behalf, but at the same time, if we look at the logistics of how he was being persecuted, he was falsely accused. And so, criticism is form of verbal, a lot of times, false accusation. That is, that is part of serving Jesus and it's good if it's false and it's good if it's for Christ, for righteousness, for the Kingdom of God. What's bad is if it's for something you did that was stupid. What's bad if it's something that we did that was not in line with God's Word. That's bad. I heard a story about uh, John Wesley. <laughs> he was upset one time because he went for three days without suffering persecution. No one threw a brig, brick or an egg for three days. He was so distraught that he stopped his horse and started to pray to God to examine his heart to see if there is any sin or backsliding in him. <laughs> he went to ask God to show him where his fault was. Right around that time, somebody from the other side of the road saw John Wesley and threw a brick at John Wesley but of course missed him. John Wesley finished his prayer with joy and got back on his horse thanking God that he is still in his purpose. Wow, what a perspective. Most of us would doubt God's presence in the midst of our persecution. John Wesley was assured of God's presence in the midst of persecution. So I want to encourage you today that being persecuted means you're part of, you're in the center of God's will. If you're verbally, you know, assaulted, sometimes falsely accused um, and you are truly pleasing the Lord and this is not because of your sin, disobedience to God or rebellion, 
then you should rejoice. Jesus says rejoice for the same treatment they gave the prophets and people that came before you. Third thing that we can do and how to relate with persecution, criticism. And that is, remember, you can't please everyone. Even Jesus could not make Pharisees happy. You cannot please everyone. What criticism does and what persecution does is it reminds you that you and I are supposed to live to please only one person and that is God. We are called to love everyone but we are called to please one. Somebody drop this in the chat. We are called to love everyone but we are to please God. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 10 it says the following, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. God does not want you to walk pleasing people. And a lot of people, they're trying to please their critics. A lot of people, they're trying to please the Pharisees. A lot of people are trying to please the religious leaders. A lot of people are trying to please the people who do not, who are honestly, cannot be pleased. God can be pleased. You're supposed to love people. You're supposed to serve people, but not please people. And there's a big difference. If you become a people pleaser, you will be crippled for the rest of your life. You will be a slave to people's opinions. You will die by their, by their disapproval and you will live by their approval. And it's the most dangerous place to live. And it takes a lot of security and it takes a lot of confidence to live to please God and to serve people, to love people, but not to live your, live your life trying to get everyone's approval and trying to live your life trying to please people. You can't please everyone. Even Jesus couldn't do that. Number four, during criticism, we must learn to respond to God instead of reacting in the flesh. Drop this in the chat. During criticism, we must learn to respond to God instead of reacting in the flesh. To respond to God takes a thought, prayer, reflection and examination. A humble spirit is required of anyone who wants to grow in God and learn from their critics. Reacting is different. It's being impatient. It's being hurt, easily offended and retaliating in the name of God. When Jesus was on the cross, His critics made fun of Him and told Him to come down. He didn't react to them. He did not yield to their mocking demand. He was living in response to the Father's wishes, not to the people's demands. Come on, this is good. Drop this in the chat. Do not live in response to people's wishes. Live in response to God's desires. Don't live in response to people's demands. Live in response to the Father's will. People will try to push you to come down from the cross. They want you to step out of the place of peace, of the place of tranquility, the place of joy, the place of union with the Lord and get in a, in a fight with them, to get in the mud with them so that you can prove a point, so you can retaliate in the name of God. I see pastors do that. I see leaders do that online. You know, they see this um, movie or they see this post or they see this movement and they quickly go in and they think that the world will be changed by their opinion. And so, and then they start name picking, picking up fights all under the name of, you know, I'm defending the faith. I am defending the doctrine. Really? You're only stirring up trouble because you like to fight. And a lot of us, we just love to fight. And instead of fighting demons, we just fight other people. Instead of fighting, I understand Jesus rebuked Pharisees and everything, but how many of those Pharisees repented after that? And so, and you and I are not Jesus. And so a lot of us, we have a lot of growing to do and picking a fight with the other side, always fighting, always retaliating, always nitpicking with every single person. And literally, um, a lot of that is not in response to God. A lot of that is reaction of the flesh. I've done it too. I can't tell you how many times I've made a tweet that I had to delete or I wanted to respond to somebody who took a jab at me and to take a jab at them, you know, like to tell them what I think, to really put them in the right place. And sometimes I even published it. And then I was like, why did I do that? This person is not going to change. Just, just leave them alone. You may say, but that will make you look weak. So what? My goal is not to look strong. What? That I could fight with them? Oh, you, you don't have a point. Jesus was silent before some of His critics. Sometimes silence is your best answer. And sometimes not picking a fight. Oh, but you can win this fight because you, you have strong arguments. 
You know, you can win a battle against skunk every day. But you're going to smell like one if you're going to fight skunks. Some people, some critics, they have nothing else to do with their life. And they stink. And if you get too close to them and you start picking a fight with them, you will win an argument. But you might lose your peace. You might lose your, your time. There's no need to pick a fight with some of that stuff. And so unless God called you to be an apolog apolog apologetic or maybe you're just, that's just kind of your calling. But for the rest of us, I really just want to encourage you. Um, respond to God. Ask the Lord, Lord, what would you want me to say in this situation? This person came against me. You know, what should I say? Should I respond? Because I don't want to react. Like sometimes when I see a common question that's being asked by, by people, I prayerfully consider, you know, to either make a video or make a statement. But if somebody comes at me, you know, most of you know that I don't read comments. Maybe 1% of comments, I scan through some and, and that's about it. But especially negative ones, the people online, they, a lot of them are nasty. Um, and they love, they don't even know who I am. They don't even know what I am. Some of them don't even follow the page, they just saw one quote. And right away they bombard with like 20 scriptures out of context completely pushing you know their agenda and they want to provoke a fight. If I would have nothing else to do with my day except sit on a computer or sit on my phone, I would probably engage but I just don't have time for that kind of stuff. And so I usually just ask the Lord, do you want me to respond? And, and I don't feel peace about responding, replying. So I just move on and I ignore it. And this way I want to keep my peace instead of always proving a point. Number five, and that is always consider the source of criticism. Is this from a critic or from a coach? My rule is this, if a person is criticizing me, I would take their criticism if I will take their advice. There are people who are successful, effective, wise and godly they usually will not attack publicly. They will correct privately and they will reach out privately and say, um, Vlad, what you did um, was wrong. What you said was wrong. Um, help me to understand it. And so, and in that case, you know, I ask myself, is this person somebody that is coming off as a critic or as a coach? Have they built anything in their life? If they would come and give me an advice, would I follow it? Have I followed their advice before? If the answer is yes, I definitely want to pay attention to the feedback, correction and reproof that they provide because God might be protecting me through their correction. And so we all need constructive criticism and feedback but the enemy will send people on the assignment to distract, destroy and defame. And we have to be careful about the source of that criticism or that attack. Some people just want to mold us into the image because they are such a people pleasers and they're far more interested to make sure that we are as pleasing to people as they are. I've had some people who say, if you only Vlad stop doing deliverance, then um, you will, um, so many more people will like you. I said, well, maybe I should also stop believing in Jesus. More people will like me. And stuff. So and they are so concerned for my reputation, more concerned than I am. And I am not, I don't want to burn my reputation to the ground, but at the same time, my reputation is not worth living or dying for. My life was committed not to build a brand or a name, but to build Jesus' kingdom. And my life is a tool in His hands. And if He wants to destroy me, my body, burn at the stake, if that's what pleases Him for me to go through that, to, for His glory and to suffer for Him and to show His goodness and, and that's, I'm His vessel, I'm, I belong to Him, that's not about me. And so we have to be very careful to fall into a spell of some people who live in fear of men and they will come in and they will try to drive you into the same fear of men and say, don't do this, don't do that, you're a little bit too radical. I remember when people told me the same thing, you know, uh, Aren't you afraid that you, you reopened the church during the pandemic, you know, when everything was still closed? You know, people are going to die. What if the news media picks up, you know, the wind of it and they are going to, you know, blast your church in front of the newspaper and, you know, destroy your church? 
But we knew that that's exactly what we needed to do is to take a bold stand against this oppressive regime and the government that stretched his hand way too far into the church. And God protected our church. God protected uh, our church from people dying. God protected our church and people start getting more saved and everything and I'm glad we did that instead of being scared of what people will think. And so we have to be very careful that we consider the source of criticism that comes against us and not blindly um, take it from every single person who just corrects us privately. Because some people literally they have fear of men and they want to impart that fear of men to you. And so you just have to be careful. Do you discern that? Um, and so yeah, number six, never argue with somebody who made up his mind that you are bad. There are people who have made up their mind that you are a false prophet or a false teacher or you are in a, in a cult. Like I have some people online who probably have that, who uh, don't have a church, don't have a ministry. Their ministry is just making YouTube videos and criticizing somebody else. They pretty much, they don't have anything really to say, some of them, uh, and they just, they just discuss other people all the time. Sounds good to me. I mean, they need to do what they need to do. But when somebody made up their mind that you are a false, prophet, teacher, Christian, you're wrong and they already made up their mind and they'll never and nothing will ever change that. I would never discuss, have a Q&A with that person. That person is not reasonable. That person is blocked off. Uh, Mark Twain said something. He said, don't argue with the fool. Onlookers may not be able to tell the difference. Ouch. Mark Twain also said, never argue with stupid people. And not that I'm calling uh, critics, cr critics stupid. I'm just quoting the quote. And never argue with stupid people because they will drag you down to their level and they will beat you with their experience. So we kind of want to be careful. My rule is usually this. If somebody is convinced I am beyond redemption, I am lost and they'll never want to hear what my point of view is, um, then you know, and they'll usually challenge, they'll do a video, hey Vlad, you know, I want to have an interview with you and stuff. And so, and you know, my team knows that I don't want to see those videos, I don't want to see those posts about me, I don't want to live in conscious awareness of who I am or what people think about me, especially the negative and the positive as well. Why? Because it's not healthy. We need to be focused on Jesus Christ and we don't want to have discussions with people who made up their mind that we're bad and who don't even have 1% leeway or like 1% chance in their mind that they could be wrong about us. And it's usually people who don't know you but they just judge you from the outside based on a few bites of clips. Number seven, if you want criticism not to affect you, don't let compliments inflate you. So um, this, is, this is the one that's been my um, big one. I remember there was a time and I was battling with uh, an accusation that came in our own church or more of like, not an accusation, but more of like some people were saying stuff about me behind my back and it got to my attention. Uh, people told me this, you know, which is also not good when um, you have a team that's constantly feeding you with garbage. And so um, I learned it down the road later on to encourage our team and to encourage even people in our staff not to um, feed me with garbage. Meaning like if people are saying really just nasty stuff, not to forward me those messages, not to forward me those videos, but to protect my heart. I don't need to know what every person who is full of you know evil um, and confusion and other stuff thinks about me. That's just, ugh, it's not necessary. I don't need that. And, but this was in the church and these people were not evil. They were good people. They belong to our church. Maybe they didn't understand me or didn't get something. I don't know what, which mosquito bit them. But they were saying stuff and somebody told me they were saying stuff. And I remember it's just like, it got under my skin for like three days. I thinking about it, losing sleep over it. We had a guest speaker on Sunday morning. As he was speaking and I'm literally, that's the only thing I'm thinking. So how they said this, I'm going to, you know, prove myself right. I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to text them right now. We're going to have a coffee and I'm going to go and clarify, my, clear, cl clear my name. As the speaker is doing an altar call, I get on my knees and at my own pew. I said, Lord, could you take this 
feelings away from me. I'm just, I don't want to think about it. I almost feel like, like this is not going away. And I felt the Lord challenge me. And He said, last week when you preached a really good sermon, He says, you got inflated. You got, um, you started to think that you were better than you actually are. And He said, this year when people attacked you, you're now feeling worse than you actually are. He says, you're not as good as the compliments that come your way and you're not as bad as the criticism that comes your way. He said, you're somewhere in the middle. And He says, for you to not be swinging to the side of criticism and making yourself feel like you have no purpose, you have no life and you're such a terrible person, you have to stop swinging to the other side when people compliment you and start thinking like you're some, some kind of a super incredible, inc amazing, powerful person. You have to have a very humble view of you that's based on what I say about you, not what people say about you or how well you perform in a particular environment. And so instead of asking God to take away the hurt the criticism was bringing, I actually got on my knees and I said, Lord, take away the pride that compliments brought. Lord, I'm not as good as people think I am. Um, forgive me for having an inflated view of myself. Forgive me for thinking that I was more loved now that my sermon was good. Forgive me for thinking that I was more, I don't know, walking with you because people got healed. Lord, I laid that at the altar. I laid the crowns, the compliments, all the good stuff at the altar. Like the Keith Green song says that when I'm doing good, help me not to seek the crown. Help me to do it for your glory. Help me to stay pure in my motives. And then when I'm being attacked or persecuted, don't let it, don't let it affect me deeply, Lord, because I am not letting the good stuff that you're doing, Lord, affect me deeply. Why? Because I'm affected by your presence, by your peace and by your word. I live by your voice, Lord. I live by your presence, not by the compliments, not by the results and not by the outcome of my ministry or gifts or callings or, or, or whatever, but I live, Lord, by your word. And honestly, that's been my approach ever since. I'm not saying I get it right all the time, but um, when people ask me, how do you fight um, criticism from affecting you? Um, I don't start with criticism first. I start with compliments. That I don't allow compliments. I'm not saying I get it right all the time, but I really try my best that the compliments do not become my bread, but compliments are my gum. I chew it and I spit it out. I don't swallow it meaning that these compliments, no matter how great they are, I know that after this compliment will also come some criticism down the road to balance so that you're never swinging to one side or to the other side. And so as long as compliments are the gum that you chew and spit it out, they're not your bread, they're not your place of getting affirmation, they're not a place where getting approval. If you live by the approval of men, you will die by their disapproval. They will kill you with their criticism. They will destroy your reputation. They will destroy your self-esteem. They'll destroy your peace. You won't be able to sleep at night. But if you don't live by men's approval, now if they give it to you, praise God, uh, you chew it, spit it out. But if you live by that approval and that is your daily bread, um, you're doomed. You're doomed. Why? Because your foundation is built on the sinking sand instead of the solid rock. And small storm, small criticism, small attacks, small persecution, small verbal abuse, verbal assault, small false accusation and you will crumble. You'll be depressed. You won't be able to function. Why? Because the way you treat yourself, how to deal with criticism is how you're dealing right now with the compliments. If you're like a starved child begging for those snacks and like compliments is like your the air that you breathe and the criticism will be the poison that will be the end of you and you don't want to live like that you want to live dependent on the rock on Jesus on his presence what he thinks of you amen is this receiving so is this helping somebody is anybody receiving this if you are drop number one in the chat let's go to um number eight we've got two more don't waste your stones on your critics. Don't waste your stones on your critics. Now, God showed me one time when David threw stones at Goliath, but when King Saul threw spears at David, David never threw 
stones or spears back at Saul. David was really good at throwing stuff. He could have easily take, taken that spear and threw it back at Saul's face and probably would have nailed him straight to the wall. But David didn't throw those things back at Saul. He uh, did not throw stones back at Saul. He, and when Shemai, who was actually throwing stones at David when David uh, was rebelled by his, when his son rebelled against him, Absalom, and David walked barefoot crying and you know this guy, uh, Shemai, uh, the guy was so horrible, he was so wicked, like literally David is like in his worst, lowest point in his life and uh, Shemai throws rocks at him. It's like, I'm thinking like how stupid can you be? David is surrounded with men who are like lions. Okay, I mean, his men were literally looking at David says, could we take his head off? Like this guy literally wanted to die, to do that to David. And so, but David does not throw stones back at Shemai. He doesn't throw stones back at Saul. And I'm looking at David and I'm noticing a very important um, secret that we need to be careful about, about retaliation. Some people use the anointing of God, lose the anointing of God because they're too busy retaliating retaliating. Now there's a difference between you defending, making a statement, uh, correcting um, a false narrative, um, you addressing an issue. But when we retaliate, when we get so hurt deeply and we think that now I can defend my image or now I can go and retaliate and cause pain, all of course under the name of God. I mean Saul was arresting people uh, in the New Testament to please God. He thought he was serving God and a lot of people do it out of zeal for God but they lack the peace of the Lord. And then uh, this is what I realized, the more you fight people, uh, anointing begins to leak, leak out because God doesn't give you anointing to fight people. The Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 10 that for this reason God anointed Jesus to heal those oppressed by the devil. God doesn't give you anointing to destroy people. God gives you anointing to heal, drive out demons, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, preach the gospel, make disciples. And so if you are going to attack every single person that is attacking you, you might end up without anointing. Oh, you'll have an opinion. You'll have a big opinion. You might even have a big YouTube channel. But God's anointing that breaks yoke might lift from your life. In fact, I would go as far as to say, if all that you're doing is attacking, it's probably a sign that you lost the anointing. Because usually anointed people are being attacked. They rarely do the attacking. The moment somebody begins to walk in the anointing, they attract persecution. The moment they lose it, they usually start doing the persecution. What happened with Paul? He attacked Christians. The moment he received that salvation, God's anointing, he started being attacked by religious people. And so number nine goes along with it. If you stop being criticized, make sure you don't become a critic. If you stop being persecuted, make sure you don't become a persecutor. Those who attack everyone seem to be the ones that used to be attacked. They used to do something productive. They used to do something that was right. And now they seem to come under attack and they are the ones that are excuse me, they are the ones that are attacking. Don't build your ministry or your Christian life around barking at everything that moves. Don't be a mosquito that lives off of someone else's blood. Like I mentioned, Paul persecuted Christians but when he became a Christian, he became persecuted as a Christian. Someone, um, I read this in a blog where one person said, you're either creating or criticizing. I'd rather be creating so that critics can have material. So you can be creating or criticizing. And so I would just really encourage you to be the person that walks, lives in revival, creates, is innovative, being used by God and not giving too much attention to critics. Number 10, the last thing. 
Don't let critics rent space in your mind by giving them too much attention. Train your team not to feed you with garbage. Train yourself not to be curious on what so-and-so said about you. Because once your well is poisoned, your ministry will be polluted. Drop this in the chat. Once your well is poisoned, your ministry will be polluted. And one of the ways the devil poisons our wells is with the poison of being too curious and too obsessed with what people think about us. And then all of our sermons are jabs. We're attacking people who don't even listen to us. We're, we're fighting people who are not even there. And then there's these people who are with you, there's people who are for you, there are people who want to go into the future with you, but you keep talking about the past. And so I just really want to encourage this to the pastors as well as uh, myself as well, to be really careful not to give critics all of our attention. Now, one of my verses that I really liked about this whole criticism part is Nehemiah chapter 6 verse 3. Nehemiah says this, when he came under attack, see when Nehemiah was attacked with slander, criticism and even threats, he kept, on, he kept on building the wall. He didn't let the critics rent space in his mind by giving them too much attention. One of my favorite sayings is actually Nehemiah 6.3, it says this, I am doing, I'm doing a great work so I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it to go down to you? That means, sorry critics, I'm kind of busy. I'm doing a great work. He wasn't arrogant or proud. He says, hey, I, I got a lot to do. I don't have time to do all this stuff. You guys have a lot of time. God bless you. I'm just going to go build a wall. And then of course he carried the sword just in case somebody got physical so that he could defend himself. But other than that, he just continued building the wall. And he outlasted his critics. He built a wall. And the only reason we know about his critics is because they played a footnote in Nehemiah's story. Remember, they don't, history does not remember critics. The only way they get remembered in history is in your story as a footnote. So, who are you going to be? Are you going to be a critic or are you going to be the one who carries the cross, follows Jesus, lives in revival, and attracts criticism. How are you going to respond to critics? Are you going to just kind of walk away? Or if there is something that sticks and you have mentors in your life that speak into your life and you, you really genuinely need to repent, then you repent. But if it's not something, if it's not reasonable, if it's not good and it's just, they're just trying to deflame you, they're just trying to distract you, they're just trying to derail you, you just walk away, keep on doing what God called you to do. Don't let it hurt you. Don't let the compliments stick to you. Be a person who walks after God and walks like Jesus. Amen. I pray that this was a blessing to each and every one of you, uh, what I've shared um, this morning. If it was, um, drop number one in the chat. Let's take a moment uh, right now and pray for people that are in this stream as you are just tuning in maybe or have been tuning in, I want to remind you that um, this weekend I'm going to be in San Antonio, Texas, Saturday night and Sunday morning. Also want to remind you in two weeks we are starting again our three-day fast and I also want to um, remind you that if you have questions you can drop them in the chat uh, right now and we are going to try to look at some of them. Um, until that time, let's take a moment and pray. I want to pray for people right now that are in this live stream who are maybe going through a very difficult time in your health. I want to pray that the Lord's going to bring healing to your body, that the Lord will bring deliverance to your mind and to your soul in Jesus' mighty name. So if you are in the chat or if you're watching live, let's just pray together right now that the Lord is going to bring that freedom, the Lord's going to bring that healing in Jesus' mighty name. Father, I thank You for Your mercy. I thank You for Your grace. Thank You for Your kindness today that You have shown us through Jesus Christ. I thank You, Lord, that we are able to do what You called us to do through the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm praying for every person that is watching this broadcast or re-watching this broadcast. 
later on today, next week, next year, or five years down the road. Dear Holy Spirit, may you move right now powerfully and bring the miracle in the lives of people that are struggling and are battling right now. If you are sick in your body, I want you to place your hand upon your heart right now. So we are live, this is not a replay, uh, but place your hand upon your body right now, we're going to pray. So if you have a sickness in your body and if you are re-watching, this, this is not a barrier for God and God is going to heal you even through the re-watch prayer. So just place your hand upon the part of the body where there is pain. Let's pray. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke that sickness right now. I command that disease to leave right now in Jesus' name. Lord, Your Word says that You sent Your Word and You healed them. Lord, sent Your Word today. The Word in Isaiah 53 that says, By His stripes we were healed and heal them right now. I speak right now for the skin to be healed. I speak right now for the digestive problem to be healed. I speak in Jesus' name for all the blood vessels, for the blood, cancer in the blood to be gone. Any other cancer, skin cancer, heart cancer, brain cancer, ovarian cancer, in the name of Jesus Christ to be removed right now. Lord, I speak healing to those that are suffering and to those that are hurting in Jesus' mighty name. Holy Spirit, bring your healing virtue right now. Holy Spirit, bring your healing virtue right now. Let your anointing fall afresh. Let your presence fall afresh. Let deaf ears open in the name of Jesus. Let blind eyes open in the name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I rebuke that eczema right now. Let there be healing from eczema right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, bring healing to asthma and breathing problems in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Somebody drop this in the chat. I receive. And if you have a testimony, make sure that you let us know. There's hungry, uh, hungrygen.com forward slash testimony. Uh, let us know what the Lord is doing with you in Jesus' name. I, I'm, as we are going to answer some uh, questions, if you uh, have it on your heart to uh, support our ministry or you want to sow into this Word, sow into this good sea, soil, um, you can do that by going to pastorvlad.org forward slash partner. Um, and this will be uh, very much appreciated. We are a ministry that does a lot of things for the Lord uh, online as well as uh, books, uh, courses, written content, um, videos. We see incredible testimonies of people's lives being changed and it's all because of people's prayer and giving. So pastorvlad.org forward slash partner uh, is a great opportunity uh, to do that if the Lord puts on your heart. Uh, become a partner. And we will take a moment and just answer some questions right now. So if you have some questions, you can drop them in the chat. Um, how are we able to, en to enter heaven? I have heard going to church and praying does not mean you will go. How to enter heaven? Very good question. The Bible says that we are saved by grace through faith. It is not of ourselves, but it is a gift from God. The scripture also says that confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and to believe with our heart that God has raised Him from the dead and you will be saved. The Bible says to repent and be converted so that the times of, so that your sins will be blotted out and so that you'll be forgiven so that the times of refreshing will be given to us. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So you're correct. Going to church alone doesn't guarantee your salvation. It's going to Jesus, placing your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, repenting of your sin, turning your way, turning your life away from sin into the Lord. That is what guarantees salvation. We don't see in the Bible that praying just a prayer of, I am sorry God, is what opens salvation. Salvation is a gift from God, but you have to receive it through faith. 
It's a grace of God. You have to receive it through faith. And you receive Jesus. The Bible says for those who received Him, to them He gave the right to become the children of God. You, you don't just receive Jesus, but Jesus receives you. And He becomes your Lord. He's not just your insurance card. He's not just your, um, you know, just in case there's a hell, I don't want to go there. Um, it's a relationship. Christianity, salvation is a relationship. And so this is not like an insurance card that you, you know, pull out once in like six months or something. It's a, it's a relationship with Him. And so it happens by faith, by grace, through faith. And you got to repent of your sins. So you can't just kind of like keep doing whatever you're doing and say, well, that doesn't matter anymore. You know, just pray the magic prayer. Um, the Bible says salvation is the new birth, meaning you get the new nature, you get the new desires. And so everything has to change. Even though sometimes it feels like maybe nothing changed, but everything changes because your relationship with God changes. Can you take the poison out? I'm assuming you're referring to the poison of when you come under criticism and you take a lot of poison. Yes, you can take the poison out. And I believe one of the ways that you can take the poison out is through repentance. Some people actually need to renounce it, but through repentance, I believe you can take the poison out. Now, will you ever be in California? Upland, Pastor Vlad, I do not have any plans to be in California um, at this um, time. What time do you start live? Is it every day? No, I'm starting live at 9 a.m. on Wednesdays on Wednesdays 9 a.m. I might move it to 10 but it's going to be around 9 a.m. 9 a.m. to 9 30 on Wednesday morning. But every day we upload Monday through Friday around the same time around 9 o'clock. So we upload but on Wednesdays is when I'm live. Can the Holy Spirit leave us if we made a sin, if we walked away from God? So I don't believe that we lose the Holy Spirit when we commit sin. I do believe that when we don't repent of our sin and we habitually sin, we, the Bible says that don't take your Holy Spirit from me, you know, and uh, restore to me the joy of salvation. I don't believe that if, if you trip, you know, God leaves you, but uh, the closeness of His presence will leave you and if the, the awareness of His presence will leave you and then what begins to happen if you stay in sin, not only you grieve the Holy Spirit, but you habitually continue to sin, you expose your life to demons and then you can come to the point where you actually can forfeit your salvation because the Bible clearly states those who practice lawlessness will not inherit the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, if you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say, He says, uh, you're not like with me. So you, you can't walk around and, and um, live however you want to, not being submissive to the Lord and just simply lean on some kind of a prayer that you prayed at the age of 16 that's not even in the Bible. And so um, walking with Jesus is not perfection, but it's about being perfected. It's not about being sinless. It's about sinning less. It's not about, it's, you're not saved by works, but faith without works is dead. And so, um, so there is no like a specific sin the same way as like, um, you know, when you get divorced, uh, when you keep on committing those sins of infidelity, you're going to lose marriage. You're going to lose your marriage. Your spouse will leave you. And so same thing with, with us and the Lord. You know, if we live unrepentant habitually, um, not only we're in danger of opening our life to demons, but I believe that we're in danger of um, forfeiting our salvation. I know this is very controversial. There's a section of Christianity who believes that no matter what you can never lose your salvation and that supposedly gives you assurance. It does give us assurance that God will not, nobody will take us out of uh, God's hand but the Bible doesn't say that you cannot leave that hand by your own volition. I believe that salvation is not a trap. You have a free choice to leave God if you want to. It's kind of like a relationship. You know, um, when I get married to my wife, you know, I'm not in a prison. If I want to leave, I will. I wouldn't, of course, I don't want to leave. I love her and I want to grow with her. But same thing with the Lord. You know, um, it's your choice to accept the Lord and it's your choice to walk away from Him. You can be a branch that doesn't bear any fruit and those branches, the Bible says, they get cut off and they get thrown into the fire. And remember, those were branches. People say, oh, if you lost your salvation, that means you never really were saved. Well, what do you do with Matthew, cha with John chapter 15, where Jesus says that those were branches who were not fruitful and they dried up and got burned. There's a lot of, and I have 
a lot of videos on that. Uh, you can check them out. I know it's controversial, but as some of you already know, I don't shy from controversy. When a Christian dies, do they go straight to heaven or do they wait until the coming of Jesus? The Bible says that we will go straight to heaven to be absent in the bodies to be present with the Lord, but our bodies will be reunited um, with our souls and our spirits at the resurrection day. But we go straight to the Lord. How do I know if the cold chills I get are the Holy Spirit or demonic spirit that was left behind? Um, I would focus less on chills and more on the fruit. What is happening to you? Um, because chills could be, you know, it could be cold outside uh, for better I know. But um, just is there fruit um, of signs of demonic oppression in your life? And is there fruit of these physical sensations? What are they producing? Uh, where are they coming from? And so that's what I would focus more on the signs and the fruits. Can you do a video on the spirit of Lilith? I actually have a video. It's called Spirit Spouse. So check it out. Check it out. Will you be coming to the UK? I don't have any plans to come to the UK. How do I know what God's plan is for me? He doesn't answer me. Um, God's plan is actually not that difficult. Read the Bible and it's there. Do what God tells you in the Scriptures. Obey the Scriptures and then other things will become more evident down the road. But God's will and God's plan for you is to read the Scriptures and to obey the Scriptures. So love one another, forgive one another, serve the local church. I mean what the Bible says, just do it. And everything else will fall into place and God will begin to reveal um, more things to you down the road. But why does God need to reveal deeper things if you haven't even got into the shallow ones? So just don't sweat about it. Just do what you need, to, what you know you need to do. Come to church, give, pray, evangelize, witness, love your family, um, clean up your bed, wash the dishes, uh, finish your school, you know, don't sleep with your girlfriend. Like basic stuff that the Bible tells us. That's plenty. That's like 99% of everything that we need to know. And then the rest of the stuff, like should I be a police officer or a teacher? Um, what do you want to be? Do you want to be a police officer? Nah, I want to be a teacher. Well, good. There we go. The Bible says, whatever you do, do as unto the Lord. God's like, whatever, as long as it's for my glory and as long as it's not illegal or contrary to the Scriptures. If March 6th through 8th, a certain type of a fast or whatever you feel led God to do. 6th um, through 8th uh, fast is what God leads you to do. I would challenge you guys to do a 72-hour um, water fast or 72-hour liquid fast but um, you can do whatever kind of a fast that you want to do. Does Hungry Gen offer premarital counseling? So we encourage people to be plugged in into small groups and we encourage people to get counseling. Um, but we don't, at this point, we don't offer, we were offering. At this point, we don't offer on the church scale, though we do have for some people who are leaders a recommendation of where they can go and get premarital counseling um, and books that you can take as well as podcasts that you can listen to to really kind of establish yourself. When is your deliverance uh, Sunday? It's this coming Sunday is our deliverance Sunday. I was baptized in a Catholic. Do I need to get rebaptized? If you were baptized as a child, as an infant, yes, you need to get rebaptized because biblical baptism is full immersion and biblical baptism deals with you being an adult who makes a conscious decision to follow Jesus. When you're an infant, you're not an adult and you're not making any decision except crying, pooping and sleeping, okay? And a priest comes in and sprinkles you with water. Biblical baptism is full immersion. Like I'm glad those priests don't immerse all their babies because some of them might die. So you, biblical baptism is an adult who have placed their faith in Jesus, repented of their sin and consciously saying, I want to follow Jesus. It's kind of like marriage. You know, you don't want to marry your infant, right? You want them to make a decision when they're old enough. So baptism is like a wedding ring. You're publicly symbolizing what you privately and internally made a decision to do. And you do that when you're old enough to, to understand what is happening. Is it true you can't go to heaven if you don't pay your tithing? No, that is not true. That is, there's no scripture in the Bible that says that uh, you're required to tithe to go to heaven. You will rob God if you don't tithe. You will rob God from the opportunity to be involved in your finances and you might, um, you know, 
not see God's grace in the area of your finances because you're not trusting Him in that area. But there is no scripture in the Bible that says that you will not go to heaven if you do not tithe. God might not win, open the windows of heaven if you don't tithe, but He will still open the doors. Is vomiting while praying a sign of the demons? Could be. Or um, um, if, if that's prayer and something is coming out, but um, yeah, definitely it could be. But I would not, if you have like also stomach flu or poison, uh, then it could be also something else. So not everything is spiritual. Things are way more spiritual than we realize, but sometimes there are things that are just natural as well. Do you have a small group on the internet? No, we do not have small groups on the internet. How do I get delivered from a spiritual husband? The same way you get delivered from every demon, through deliverance. How do we know that we are born again? How do we know that we are born again? Well, have you confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you repented of your sin? Has the Holy Spirit produced the, the new nature um, in you? And so typically the evidence of that, it's kind of like when a baby is born. It has appetites, desires, and it grows. It has a nature. Uh, new nature, new, new life and so that's kind of what happens with new birth is you get this new life that's produced by the Holy Spirit um, and with it comes new desires. Um, so sometimes people who say I got saved and they have absolutely no desire toward God, like that's questionable. Like I wonder if they got born again or if they just got conceived. I know it's not in the Bible but like if maybe, I don't know, the Lord just started that process because if you're born again like your desires change. I'm not saying everything changes and you become perfect. But like you, you start having this desire toward God. As the Bible says, as newborn babes who desire the milk of the Word. You have desire toward God's, uh, God's Word. You have desire. It's not that you, you don't have any more fleshly inclinations, but it's just there is a desire for God. Okie dokie. Guys, thank you so much for joining me live today. This uh, was incredible. So God bless you all. Have a wonderful day. Um, we're going to leave this stream on so you can rewatch it, share it with other people, as well as I will see you next Wednesday at uh, same time, 9 or 9.30. And for those of you in San Antonio, I want to see you this Saturday at 7 and on Sunday at 11 a.m. Um, if you're coming to Tri-Cities, we have a Deliverance Sunday this weekend as well. The Lord will meet you at the point of your need. Until then, remember you were raised to deliver.